You're watching Fanboy Versus with your hosts, J.D. Church, Nicole Hale, Chris Triplett, and Chris McFeely. And you are watching Fanboy Versus. I am your host, J.D., joined this week by Chris McFeely. Greetings, sir. Hello. Nicole. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. We call into the the echo of emptiness. Yes, it is just Chris McFeely and I this week. Uh, Triplet is out. Uh, Nicole is out as well. Uh, So, this is what you got. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, So this week it is fanboy versus Blue Steel, as we delve into the world of uh, the Avengers mugshots and other movie news before we go to the reviews that we. Have. It's g- gonna be a bit random and scrappy. <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot of fun. <sighs> you googly, uh, you googly. So, um, I don't know. I guess let's start with that. The Avengers uh, yeah, mugshots well, I mean, picture. Well, first of all, we'll say that the the trailer is gonna be online on the eleventh. I think is the... I hadn't actually heard. I'm, I'm not clear. You keep seeing these little videos about sneak peeks and things, and then it just turns out to be the bit from the end of Captain America anyway. Yeah, and that's probably what you we're... click on them, and that's all they are. Probably what we'll get. So, um, I that is my understanding though, is that the the trailer is supposed to be posted or something on the 11th. I think is the the date that I have. Chat, feel, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But what we did get was pictures of the cast. Uh, some of this was featured in uh, EW. And um, so these are uh, Entertainment Weekly. Uh, so mug shots of the cast. Um, really doofy looking mug they, shots. Some of these are the most wacky, just, you know. Most um, of them are just straightforward, like head on shots. And there's nothing wrong with that, except it, Dogs look like their eyebrows have been painted on and everyone. Yeah, they are really... They really look like they're clabbered with makeup. So, yeah. Which they probably are, but... Uh... The uh, Stark is... Uh, that shot is just... I don't know. But the, the great one, though, the best of them all, has to be Mark Ruffalo as Bruce Banner uh, featuring, I don't know, Latigra, Blue Steel, Magnum, if you will. A very They're Zoolander. The same look. <laughs> I feel like I'm on crazy pills. And that uh, one look Michael Turner used to draw everybody as having. Yeah, it's it, it is really bizarre. Like I don't know what he, is it. Do you know I don't know what he's, he's trying to invoke. It's just. <laughs> it's Bruce just like, Banter Center for Gamma Research and children would want to learn other science is good too. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna have to be at least a three three times as big. Um. <laughs> This is a school for ants. Um, but he, <laughs> it's just, and that is the best dressed I think Banner has like ever been. Yeah. And he's um, wearing a purple shirt, so you know it's him. It's oh, yeah. Him. And a blazer, too, but it's unbuttoned, no tie. It's very, you know, he's very chic That's that way. You know, he's a casual scientist. Yeah, with the big hair. He just hair. practices science on the side. I don't, it's, it's just, the, it is so wacky. I don't even know. <laughs> You know, like I Jeremy said, Jeremy Renner is still really looking the part as Hawkeye, though. Oh yeah, he's he's got that down. I mean, it's like just... we saw a couple of other pictures that came out alongside those mug shots, like in the last week, and it's just a couple of action shots and green screeny things. But Renner's doing them. Get the bow out, and I'm like, I'm liking that. I'm looking forward to seeing Renner because it's like, if for all, I mean, I'll do, I love Thor, but so everything about Thor was good as far as I was concerned, <laughs> but um. For, like, speaking two sentences, I really liked Ranner's, like, really brief little turn as Hawkeye. Because I don't know how they managed it, but in, like, two sentences, I really knew I was looking and, and listening to Hawkeye. They really yeah. got him, they got his personality across really well in, like, two sentences. You better make the call. I'm starting to root for this guy. I haven't, I haven't seen many <laughs> interviews. Some other guys you'd like to have him beat up. I haven't seen many interviews. Is, was he, like, just, is he just... Does he just happen to embody the character? I mean, does or has he really done his research? I don't know. It's just, I wonder if that's like accidental or just a lot of work on his part. To... Well, you barely saw his face in Thor, but they, they gave him the good Hawkeye-ish lines he had anyway. Mm-hmm. So that's so. I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of. I'm still looking to, forward to Avengers. I can't. I mean, this. You know, I I, I think it's going to be solid. I'm liking it. 
Um, I think it's the most positive, the most positive buzz or the most promising movie, superhero movie we know we're getting next year. Oh yeah, yeah. What do we get? We get the Amazing Spider-Man, which is like, uh, yeah, okay, we get that. But frankly, given the given the current trend of Marvel movies, I don't know what to expect. You know? Yeah, I mean, because it's yeah, those have been. I mean, not as miss as, say, DC movies, but, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Green Lantern, which comes out on DVD you, uh, this week. Did you, you get that? You're going to get, get, get that? Then? Um, I, in hard copy, probably not. <laughs> I don't like, know. I, I, I want to at least see the extended cut that's going to be on the Blu-ray film to I, see what they've done with it although frankly i don't understand the school of thought that says adding stuff to that film is the way to fix it yeah i've heard that comment a couple of different places as well so i i don't know i i've had a preview copy i guess for a few weeks and i still have not brought myself to watch it so uh, uh, i've got to you haven't even watched it once i, I know. have the benefit of not of having watched it and knowing yeah so um <laughs> But uh, but other uh, other DC news. We got a picture this week of uh, Jor El. Well, some some hobo snuck onto the set and put on <laughs> Jor El's costume. Yeah. Um. Wow. I mean, it, uh, what? Mm. Can I just say I like I like the outfit. I see what they've done there. I looked at it a bit, and it's like he's got blue underneath. It, he's got the cape, and he's just wearing like armored bits on top of it. I like the idea behind the outfit, but Russell Crowe needs to shave or some shit. Yeah, I don't like this dirty Jor-El look. I always envision Jor-El being very clean cut, very it, you know. You know what I was thinking. Um, the actors who have played Superman's dad. It's pretty crazy when you think about it. Marlon Brando, David Warner, Terrence Stamp. These great, like, mm -hmm. thespians. Russell Crowe. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I never well, really thought about it before, but that's a role that has pulled in some mad talent. <laughs> yeah, and Russell Crowe. And Russell Crowe, <laughs> the Mikey movies fighting around the world. <laughs> Don't you look at me, you vagina. <laughs> we promised you random people. We are there. <laughs> yeah, I... I don't know. I don't like the. I I don't like the. I mean, I, yeah, okay. I get the blue bits and the capey thing, but it's 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 too much. It's it's too Odin esque. I think for me. It, it, I don't know if it's about ornate or, but it's um. I don't know. I don't know. Well, we'll see. We'll see what it looks like on the screen. Yeah, I, you know, that can one make of these things is you do always have to wait to see what it looks like on the screen. Right. Although the Odin's costumes from, from. Uh, Thor looked really awesome, both in pictures and on. Screen. Hell yeah, bro! So. Uh, you see where Jor-El falls down is he doesn't have a hat. Yep, no hat. Boy, they, I, I do again. I still give it to DC though for like unifying this the Superman look and managing to like actually have Superman of the new film look like he does in the new Fifty Two. Oh, for so. God's sake! The, the similarities end at not wearing underpants. I don't know. I'm looking at this. There's a there's a better full body shot that I'm looking at on here, and it it looks a lot like the the comic version. Well, what's he got? Mm. A collar and some seams. Um. Well, it's missing the collar, but it does have like the hand, like the little bit of the pointy bits on the hand and the seams and stuff. So I don't know. <sighs> what else? What else in news? Um, uh, that's about all the movie stuff we heard, isn't it, really? Yeah, there's some comic bits, I guess. There are a few little bits. Nothing too serious. Marvel started teasing something a couple of days ago. White text on a black background. It's coming. That's so lame. I d I d yeah, what? that is pretty weak. Like, I mean, you don't even have to know. You know as, a, as, a, as Marvel doesn't Hello. even have to know what it is to put that teaser out. Yeah. You know? They're just like, I will think of something. Or just tell them it's coming, whatever it is. Yeah, that doesn't... I mean, that press releases have been, you know, more to the point and been just as vague as that, you know. I mean, I don't know. 
Mm. But the following day, we got another teaser. Now, whether or not it's referring to the same thing, it's probably not. But uh, it's, it's uh, again, entirely black background, white text. What if there wasn't only one? And a red star. Uh, for... Now, a lot of sites have gone with the idea that this could be about a possible return of Bucky. I don't know. I think... I mean, died. no, that's, you know, I read, um, I read Captain America No Escape this week, which is Brubaker's, well, it's not, it's the final Captain America story arc before the book splits in two into Captain America and Bucky and uh, Captain America. So it is the last uh, Brubaker story arc with Bucky as Captain America before he dies in Fear Itself. And after I finished the book, I was even more pissed off at Fear Itself for killing him. <laughs> You guys, you may remember I wasn't very happy about it at the time, but having read this, I'm even less happy now because the whole premise of, of No Escape is about Bucky being taken to a Siberian gulag, notionally convicted in absentia for war crimes by the Soviet Union, but in reality being taken so his mind can be probed by a Soviet general to remove uh, activation codes for Soviet sleeper super soldier agents hidden in America since the Cold War. And Bucky is like, the whole, it's like Bucky is now too tarnished to be Captain America again, so Steve can be Cap. But it's like, no, he doesn't have to, no, Bucky realizes he doesn't have to live out someone else's role in some directionless attempt at atonement for his past misdeeds. No, he can actually take on a problem that was his to handle and truly redeem himself in a direct and focused way. And then he died. <laughs> Except that he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So whether or not this might have something to do with that, if the planted agents could be like other winter soldiers or other super soldiers like he was, and that's what the only one refers to, maybe that's what's going to go on. You know, so mm. there's that. It's remarkable how, how uh, fucking half a dozen words and a red star <laughs> can manage to make you think. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, it, yeah, because the star definitely invokes like a Captain America kind of feel. But I mean, who knows? It could go in a completely different it could direction. Indeed. I don't. I mean, there's nobody else is really associated with a star like that, though, are they? Not that I, I know think. of. Mm. And yeah, hmm. it brings to mind. We'll see. Uh, it'll all be spoiled in like two days or something. So. <laughs> well, they're um, probably gonna probably going to throw out a few more of these vague things over the next couple of days we'll see it's really crap i hate i hate yeah. i hate when they do that you know, or, or when it's not even over yet or when creators do crappy things like lie to you about something they're linking you to and then link you to what, their crap whatever could you be referring to oh it, it, like i said I, I probably am one of the few people that was just a little irked but um, as we talked about before, like I said, the Avengers trailer is supposed to be released this coming week. And uh, Mark Miller posted on Twitter, not once, but twice, um, that, uh, oh my gosh, the Avengers trailer is up. Go to this link. And you go to the link, and he's like, oh, did I say Avengers trailer? No, I meant my promo for Superior. Mark Miller. Yeah. And it's like, that's not cool, dude. I, I mean, okay, it's funny to you because you're a prick. But it's not, you know whatever you know miller's not having a great track record this week kick-ass 2 number four came out this week was it no it was actually was it last week uh, i know it was actually last week yeah. um nobody's really talking about it because it's kick-ass and it's marked as a mature book so whatever you know but there's some very nasty stuff in kick-ass 2 number four that has, has caused at least one customer of mine to end their order for it wow like what yeah Oh, you know, the usual child murder and rape. Oh, lovely. Oh, yeah. always nice. You know, <laughs> if they ever make a Kick-Ass 2 film, that ain't gonna man. Yeah, which seems likely that they'll make the film. I can say that but... I'm rooting for Kick-Ass to kill Red Mist by the end of this series, though. Okay. I know nothing about Kick-Ass, so I don't know. It was on... Watch the film yet. I know, it's on Netflix. It's on my it's in my Netflix uh, stream, but... Uh... Yeah, those green arrows. I mean, less. yeah. Well, that'll yeah, that <laughs> that too. And I have all this free time, so you know. <laughs> anyway, so I guess I guess that brings us then to um, the digital kerfuffle. Then 
Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, DC announced recently that it was uh, going to release 100 graphic novels exclusively on the Kindle Fire. I believe this is the new. I don't. I haven't mm-hmm. made the digital switch over yet. This is the new version of the Kindle. Yeah, it's the new version of Amazon's Kindle, the Kindle Fire. Well, um, Barnes and Noble have just sort of uh, taken thick because it wasn't offered to them for their e-reader, and uh, uh, you know, making the claim that they won't uh, physically stock a book that they can't offer a digital copy of. They have pulled all 100 of these graphic novels from store shelves across the country. Talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. Woo. Man, that's... that. Like, yeah. Bookshops are dying on their horses as it is. Yeah. Yeah, and Barnes & Noble, they actually still depend on their brick and mortar. Um, yeah. Amazon. Um, where's Amazon's store? Uh, oh, yeah, they're not. So that's dumb. <laughs> that's just, I, I, I don't know. I, and it's not going to hurt. It's, it's not going to hurt DC because people, I mean. Well, it might a little. Uh, Bookshow, bookstores. Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, the, well, the thing is, though, is like the Kindle, the Kindle Fire, I think, is much more capable than most of the Nook readers anyway. I don't know anything about it. So, well, I know that that's what's going down. <laughs> yeah, so I think from a tech standpoint, I think, and I mean, that's the whole deal is that the the Kindle Fire was really, I mean, part of its design was for comics, and I until the Nook catches up, I, I you know, I, I can't see why. Uh, but this includes know. like Watchmen, The Dark Knight Returns, all of Sandman. Like this is not, I mean, obviously because they were the one hundred prime books that they picked to offer. These are not little books you know these are the continuous best-selling graphic novels you know but the, the people that are gonna read that or, or get those they're gonna walk into barnes and noble oh that's not there i guess i'll buy it on amazon you know exactly I mean... that's it. <laughs> so bookstores it's... dying on their arses they don't <laughs> people don't need another reason to be switched over to the internet yeah it's not like they're gonna go shucky darn i'm gonna have to write a letter the DC I'm and gonna them... have to uh, <laughs> the, uh, place an order for that with my library. Yeah, Ugh. not not the best call there. Wow. <sighs> so, I uh, what are you gonna do? But I'm excited what about the Kindle Fire. Of... I mean, I think it's I think it's good that you know companies finally put a little bit of thought into saying, hey, comics would be great on this. And um, which is, you know, part of what they've done with that Kindle Fire. And that's really reasonable. I mean, you talk about $200 for the Kindle Fire um, versus several hundred dollars for the iPad. So um, that's going to be, I think, I don't know. I think that'll be good. I think DC's smart. I think they should stick to their guns and uh, let all that stuff be sold on the fire and really run with it. Because I think that's going to oh, be... Oh, God, the... yeah. I wouldn't back down from it. It's Barnes & Noble who have the beef. Yeah. They're just being childish. Like, you have something yeah. that we didn't... Why didn't we... He got more pe- potatoes than I did in this dinner. <laughs> he got more peas. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, don't be... Yeah, you know, they're the ones with the beef. You know, it, it's more their problem, really, than Daisy's, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's uh, not much else going on this week, though. Yeah. Not even comics. <laughs> no, I mean, it was announced that Andy Kubert's going to be doing two issues of Action Comics in the new year. Oh, so now it's still six for um, for Action and then and then on to the other. So is that he's going to be taking over after Morrison? or? No, no, he's just writing it for two. He's drawing it for two oh, issues. Oh, he's drawing and, for two. And then, issues. then Morales is coming back. Yeah, he's just drawing gotcha. two issues. Well, who's taking oh, over so writing? Was, uh, Hmm? We don't know who's taking over. Is Morrison staying on for writing, or is it still? Oh six hell in the past? yeah, Morrison's not going to let this go. Morrison on Superman in the mainstream. This is not going to go away in a sh- in short order. I thought it was I mean, six. I, and I, moving I conjecture. No, I mean everything is getting at least six. But I would be amazed if Morrison didn't keep writing this. Hmm. Okay, I'm for that. Because yes, I'm reading yeah. Superman action comics anyway. Crazy. I see. It was also confirmed Batman was the top seller uh, out of the new 52. Really? Oh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, for the month of September, Justice League was sold in the last week of August. Out of the 51 titles released in September, Batman ah. was number one. Gotcha. 
Hmm. Batman, followed by Batman at number one, followed by Action Comics, Green Lantern, Flash, Superman, Detective Comics, The Dark Knight, Fear Itself came in at number eight, Ultimate Comics, Spidey at number nine, Batman and Robin at number ten. Uh, the rest of the top 20 was sold out with Green Lantern, New Guardians, Batgirl, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern Corps, Teen Titans, Aquaman, Batwoman, Amazing Spider-Man, Red Lanterns, and Justice League Dark. Justice League Dark is the surprise. Wow. But like, I think I said it in the past, like that book is just called Justice League, so to get people to buy it, you know. Yeah, it's got that Justice yeah. League thing, and they're like, oh, Justice League, check that off. And it's then they read it, and they're team, like, what? Yeah, so that's going to drop pretty hard, I would say, in the second month. Yeah. Not that I'm ragging on these things. I mean, you know, it, it'll drop, but it'll still be top 50 almost as you But, you know, that's one that I think has very seriously traded on its name, whereas the rest of these books are, are what they claim they are, if you know yeah. what I mean. Well, and I think so, that's... You know, that's a total decimation by DC. Um, oh, yeah. To, to September, which is not surprising. Uh, smash. Yeah. I think, you know, it's good that, uh, though, that I think they are getting at least six, because I think that'll, you know... I think that gives them enough time to be what they are and then get, you know, give people an idea of what they're going to be or if they need to make a change or whatever. Um, you know, cause obviously some of these titles as we get into the second issues are not going to be. Oh, well, you're still you going know. to see, um, second printings on a lot of things now in the second month. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more printing, possibly even a third printing or two. And there'll be second printings into the third month as well. Um, until the retailers are just able to pin down the numbers, you know, mm -hmm. um, this month, retailers will be placing orders for the fourth issue, so they'll probably have managed to get a handle on what sort of quantities they need by the end of this month. Yeah, because I know a lot of stuff is selling out at my shop, and we can't, you know, if I'm not there on Wednesday, I'm SOL, so, which I've not been, which is sad. So, List. <sighs> yeah, well, I don't want to put it all on my pull list. <laughs> <laughs> Grab what you can. Yeah, so, anyway. All right. Well, um, now that that portion of the show is done, uh, we're into reviews, and that'll... No, I don't know what to do. <laughs> That's going to go fast. Um, so well, you, you, you know what you're doing, so you yeah, go first. <laughs> I guess I'll go ahead and start off. Um, so let's see. Um, Justice League International is where I will at least begin. Um... I'm I so I'm still I'm still liking this uh this series. One thing I will say about this week is it's kind of sad to not have the Where's Waldo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that was just a fun element for that month, but oh well. Um this uh, this issue is much more about the team trying to come together. There's obviously a lot of personalities uh that are in the JLI that have all been thrown together and uh not a lot of necessarily confidence in terms of, you know, what Booster is doing. Uh, even on the part of, somewhat, but not completely on the part of Booster himself. Um, you know, they get attacked. At the end of the last issue, they started to be what they thought was being attacked by this gigantic robot thing. Mm. And um, so they're trying to reassemble, but it what they figure out later is that it's actually doing its own thing and not really attacking them. So that's even worse because it doesn't even really know that they're there, uh, which is what really scares Batman in this issue. Um, Ice gets hurt at one point and Booster decides, all right, that's it. We're in over our heads and they pull out. Half the team is like, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, Rockets Red and some of the others are like not real happy about retreating. Um, that kind of brings in, and that, you know, of course, seeing Ice get hurt brings Guy back into the fold. Um, but they do, and that's another interesting thing, talking about, like, the changes. And um, we knew that there had been a, a, at least somewhat of a pass between Ice and, and Guy. Mm -hmm. And at Guy sort of comes in trying to ask if she's okay, in which she says that she is. He makes the comment if she missed her, if uh, she missed him. And she just says, we just went on a few dates. So, obviously, their relationship has been fairly condensed. Um, Only five years, J.D.? That's, that's, uh, yeah, I know. Not a lot of uh, time to have had a long relationship. Um, I don't know. I mean, mainly this is... There's a... Uh, 
it, it is mainly just about the team coming together and realizing that there's a larger, even larger threat. Because not only is there this one enormous robot, but there's like three others uh, across the world, which were alerted to by Skeets. Woo! Because there was a little bit of a question after the first issue of Skeets was was going to be around, but we actually talked to Skeets, even though we don't see him, but it is pointed out that he is a um, probe. Uh, Batman even mentions that, if he still has a security droid. And, good, uh, good. So, yes. So, Skeets Ooh. is intact in the New 52. That's good news. Um, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I mean, it's hard to kind of go into much detail. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, there's fun bits. The poking between uh, August General and Iron and Rockets Red is just fun. It's always fun when current and post-communists make fun of each other and try to, Contemporary. Try to, try to one-up each other on who has the better history and technology. Rockets Red is just, I don't know, he's funny. Because he talks about not wanting to surrender because they didn't surrender to Hitler or, Pol- or uh, Napoleon or whatever. <laughs> it's like... In Soviet Russia. Yeah, exactly. We did not surrender. Um, yeah. But, I mean, of course, the team comes home to the... Uh, something else that had happened in the last issue was the uh, Hall of Justice had been blown to bits... So not only that, but they come home and they have nowhere to go. <laughs> There's no Hall of Justice. Um, but I think we finally have the full team together. We see guys, you know, now with the team. So there was a little bit of question as of at least the last. And then at the end, and um, how is it that Guy Gardner is the Green Lantern who gets two books? Well, you no, know, because Hal has two books. He's on. I the... guess. He's on Justice League. Isn't yeah, he's he? on the regular Justice League. So. But that's in the past. Well, he's currently on the... Well, I guess he, you know... Yeah, I don't know. That is a good question, because... I guess that just means Green Lantern Corps will be John's book. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. How is that going to... Because if, if in current Green Lantern he's not, when they bring... Justice League to pre- I guess that'll be the thing is that Hal will get his ring back before they bring Justice League back into the present. Okay. I don't know because that's one of the things we had talked about is that the green at least as far as and that's one of the things I think that's interesting here is because we talk you know again we're looking at this sort of mesh together what did what didn't happen and we had talked about how the Green Lantern seemed like for the most part they were still intact. So it's interesting to see Guy interfacing with this team because, you know, we do see some things that are different, you know, like I said, with his relationship with Ice and such. I don't know. Um, The only other point is that um, Godiva's, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. Was this a, did we decide if this was a pre-existing character? It is, isn't it? Godiva is, yes. We figured that out. Was she always kind of... Trampy? No idea. Okay. Just kind of... Please do not assume anybody knows or cares. <laughs> yeah. I don't... She's... She really, really wants a piece of booster, apparently. Well, um, who wouldn't? Yeah. Know. You know. Yeah. She even uses the term menage a trois at one point, talking about people who are on his side. But, yeah, I don't know. It's a little... The, again, and it just brings up there's a lot of, I don't know, forced sexuality in this new 52 that I don't understand why we have to have that. But whatever. I don't want to dwell on that point, I guess. Uh, at the very end, though... Not again. <laughs> yeah, not again. At the very end, we are introduced to um, a villain-ish or something. There's some alarm system or something goes off and goes into deep space. We see an enormous ship and there's like skull trophies all over the place. Uh, The alert that's going off says planet three dash one four seven is active and a person emerges, a, a person thing emerges from like a cryo containment. If I didn't know better, um, which I don't, um, (laughs) Oh gosh, now I forgot his name. Um, the uh, uh, ma- uh, now I can't. Why did mm, uh, Superman villain? Uh, 
damn it, blue and purple and Sinestro core guy. Mongo. 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 Yes. Thank you. Okay. I'd say it was Mongo. All right. Well, it might I, be. I would say it is a new 52 version of Mongo. Hold it up there. Against the rules. That's just. This is just for me. Okay, there's too much glare. I can't. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't really look like Mongol. I wouldn't. I don't know. I don't think so. Mm. I don't know. It just kind of invokes that feel. But um... sorry, listeners of the podcast, that wasn't for you. That was for me here on the video. I know. We have <laughs> we had this new rule thing that we set up about not showing things to the camera, but that's just for me. Anyway, so I don't know. New villain, new baddie. And that, there's another comment. I mean, um, even um, Gail Simone was commenting that, you know, in, as far as all the books, they're wanting them to focus on new villains. So I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to be something different. But anyway, I like it. I'm going to stay on JLI. I'm keeping with it. Staying strong. Stay in the course. I, don't, I, I want to know more about some of these other side characters. Like, I don't know anything about August General and Iron. No idea about Godiva. They had a um, series. Vixen. <laughs> they did. Yeah, the Great Tan. Okay. Was it great? Well, it, it was so great that it got cancelled at issue nine. It was a limited <laughs> it was a limited series of ten issues. And they cancelled it at nine. Off at number nine. That the is... idea was to be one issue for each character. That is like F U. <laughs> we we can't it's even serious. be bothered to put out the last issue. Of your series. Wow. Um But if you wanted to learn more <laughs> That would be that would be the way to do it. Yeah, I you know, like I said, it's it's interesting, you know, again, it's gonna be interesting to see the, the team coming together. Um I sort of some of these characters I had already enjoyed from um the Gen Lost run. You know, in particular I love Rockets Red. Um from that for some reason. It's just got that quirky, very Soviet Russian very, Yakov Smirnov in armor. Yeah, exactly. Very dated, and yet he's got some very endearing qualities and very loyal and those kinds of things. So I like that character. But And, of course, Booster. I can't. I can't say enough about Booster. Love you can't turn down a Booster. Can't turn down Booster at all. No. Be glad when he gets his own book again. Fingers crossed. So anyway, so there you go. JLI. Good stuff. Going to stay on that one. Um, interested to see more stuff, more reveals. That's what I want. More reveals, more things about the new 52. So, um, do you want to review something or do you want to talk about? I, yeah, already? I'm going to talk about a couple of things in rapid succession. Oh, okay. Quickly, You're going to give a well, quick uh, fire. Reviews. Yeah. Uh, Cause I got, it's so very random. Uh, well, I, I told you about, um, Captain America, no escape earlier because I read a lot of graphic novels. I'm trying to catch up on my graphic novels quickly before Transformers Exiles comes out and I have to give time over to reading a proper book. Right. Um, so I didn't. I did not have many comics this week, which is why I'm not talking about them. But I did read Swamp Thing number two, which is. Uh, I put it to you this way: it's a brave man who goes back and starts fiddling around with what Alan Moore did on Swamp Thing. Ooh, they didn't, did they? Ooh. ooh. It's, no, not ooh. It's all still there. It's all still intact. It's just that some of the rationales have changed. I mean, it turns out that the Swamp Thing who popped up at the end of last issue and was the cause of such a surprise to me is, in fact, one of the former Swamp Things. Now, it was Alan Moore, I believe, who introduced the idea that there had been multiple Swamp Things before um, Alec... Um, Holland became a Swamp Thing, and they all go off and live in the Parliament of Trees. Um, but this one has been dispatched to Holland because he needs to be Swamp Thing again. And uh, the, essentially, the, 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 my God, there is, you know you're reading a vertical book by any other name. There is so much uh, text in this issue. Oh, wow. I, can't, I can't illustrate uh, how many speech bubbles there are. In, in, in there's there's two double page spreads in particular that are just drowning in it, in which the other Swamp Thing explains that Alec Holland was actually always supposed to become Swamp Thing per the design of the Parliament of Trees. But his body was too badly damaged by the chemicals, by unnatural substances, by science, that it was unsalvageable. And so they created the purely vegetable matter swamp thing with Holland's memories in an attempt to create the avatar that he needs to be. But it didn't work. 
And now they want Holland to be Swamp Thing again. Whoa! That is, like, right on the edge. I wow. know, it's like, it's a brave man who goes back and starts <laughs> dicking with Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. But he's made it work. And we also find out what the hideous mass of blood, bone, and feathers is this this issue as well. Um, uh, it's, um... Well, Swamp Thing is the green, and uh, when we know the green is vegetable, and, and um, red is, is meat, red is the meat space, the red is what Animal Man taps into for his powers, and that's, mm. the, that's the, the, animal, the animal world. Well, this entity is the other. He is neither, neither creature, nor is he plant. He is a force of, of, of entropy and, and decay and opposition to life. Who now has risen? Ooh. There are more backwards head zombies. There's doors getting stoved in, and there's the surprising last page return of a standard Swamp Thing supporting character as well, with a rather unexpected mission. Hmm. So it continues to be well worth your time to read. But I must admit, I was a little tired when I started reading this. <laughs> when I turned the page and saw all of the giant orange speech bubbles, oh. I did. I did grow in a little bit. <laughs> oh wow! You know that's that kind of change though. Interesting about like that little bit of massaging the history. That's one of those things that Alan Moore is either going to just like King Kong crazy break stuff, or he's just going to sit back and be like, "Bravo!" Nah. <laughs> no, no, you, no. What Mostly... Alan Moore is actually <laughs> going to do is <laughs> ignore uh, it. No. no, Alan Moore is going to be sitting there drinking his tea, going, "Somebody changed something I wrote in a comic." Well, I didn't read that. You know, yeah. Alan Moore is not even <laughs> going to acknowledge yeah, exactly. the fact that anything happened in a comic. Uh, comics. I don't read comics. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Die a tread on burst dog's stomach. <laughs> uh, oh, Alan Moore. Oh, Alan Moore. <laughs> <laughs> He knows the score. Oh, what man. else did I read this week? Um, I, as I say, I've been reading graphic novels. Uh, I read the uh, the second volume of uh, the Phoenix Wright manga. I read that over the last few days. I love the Phoenix Wright video games. So the fact that they've started to translate this. This is a five-volume series, and they're bringing it out once every two months. So they're really rocketing through it. And I really needed to get this read because the third one is out in like two weeks' time. But... Uh, it's written by an it's written by uh, Kenji Kuroda, who's actually a mystery novelist. So he's managed to put together some truly insane, uh, real, just bonkers Phoenix Wright style mysteries. You ever play the video games? Uh, I don't think so. You should play the video games. They're great. Law simulators. <laughs> Mind you, I, I think um, that well, the, this is the second volume, as I say. So it contains chapters. The first volume was uh, one long. Uh, one, it was three chapters in each volume. The first book had the introductory chapter, and then chapters two and three were the first two parts of a four-part story. The other two of which are contained within this volume. Um, I think maybe his mystery novelist roots took a hold of him a little too strongly there because um, it did take until the end of the second chapter and the first book before the murder victim actually died. <laughs> wow. So, so the whole second half of the, this, is, this book is almost entirely set in court following on from the events of the previous one. There's not too much I can uh, uh, go into in it because it's a mystery novel. Uh, that's the thing. I mean, they're, they're, they're really like good, solid mysteries. Um, uh but what was really cool was when I was reading the conclusion um, and like some, you know, it's like, oh, certain revelations came about. And I was like, hang on. And I went and got volume one down off the shelf and looked back through it. And you could actually see that it had been drawn in such a way to hide these extra little facts in the images that you would only have spotted them if you were looking for them. And it's very well put together. And if you're at all a fan of the Phoenix Wright video games, I would strongly recommend it. Um, they did two, two volumes of Phoenix Wright manga were brought out by, I think it was Del Rey before... Um, but those were just collections, uh, like anthology collections of short stories, doujinshis, like done by professional fans of the series. Whereas this is actually a, a real 
series of mystery stories like the Phoenix Wright video games. And uh, I don't video game much anymore. The DS kind of ruined me for video games. I don't console game very much at all. And I blame Phoenix Wright for a lot of that because it was just this whole other kind of game that I'd never really played before. The, the visual novel, as they call it in Japan. And... Um, yeah, he ruined me for it, and I'm still really angry that Capcom's not going to be translating uh, Ace Attorney Investigations 2. But bring on Phoenix Wright versus Professor Layton. Right on. That's another thing that's yeah. happening. You're just staring there, blank face. I have no and... idea. Is everything that you're talking about the game, the thing? I have no idea. So, wow. Um, sounds interesting, though. Um, is it like a like a text thing or what? Yes. Okay, yes. so it's like a text. It's, I mean, there's pictures there, but well, yeah, uh, but it's mostly yeah, like but a it's, text it's adventure, dialogue-heavy. Uh, find the contradictions in people's sentences and use evidence to disprove their claims in court. It's a law simulator. That sounds like it would bore Americans. I don't know. Ah, yes, but that's uh, <laughs> because it's an entirely, it, it is like no law system you've ever, I, no, like no real life law system you've ever actually <laughs> beheld. Uh, is that good the or bad? People can get away, <laughs> it's entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get too much law in the current news right now between like okay, Amanda buddy. Knox and. All the other stuff that's going on right now and in terms of like American legal news, I'm like, I can't handle any of that. So it's not been a good year. Yeah. Um, it's been a slightly better year for the Transformers ongoing series. Hey, you. there you go. There's something we can talk about. I read that's that. That's something that uh, spent the first half of this year pulling its boots up. Yeah. And, uh, re- getting itself back in order. And now and, it's um, like uh, that, that unfortunately... went to a drunken party and... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Chaos. Uh, chaos started, unfortunately. and um, It's lived up to that name, hasn't it? <laughs> chaos is such a mess. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the intent, I think we said it before when we talked about the last issue, but the intent was obviously that Chaos was going to be a separate miniseries, and the story that's currently running in the ongoing series uh, called The Police Action, also known as The Last Story on Earth, was just going to be the story that ran concurrently in the ongoing. So now instead they're working on alternating issues. But police action is so much better than chaos. Way, way so, I mean, better. It, simply put, like this is the story that the ongoing has spent two years working towards. There are plot threads in this that go right back to the very start of the ongoing series that are coming together and coming to fruition now. And it certainly doesn't look like this is really going to be the last story on Earth either, because there are some hints dropped about conspiracies in this issue that imply a a story that will reach much further than can possibly be uh, uh, resolved in the one chapter the storyline has remaining. Um, No, I mean, it's just so much better than chaos <laughs> i just laugh openly in the face of it this is the story the the very human involved story set on earth and chaos is the one that's in space with only robots oh that's all transformers fans ever want and it's bollocks it's terrible it's really bad i mean the like i mean in every element it's not written very well it's not the art is um is nice per panel but not you know, but indistinguishable. It's, it's not even nice per panel. Like he draws great sweeping vistas, great scenery art. Like the pictures we've seen of the Deceptic God in the next couple of issues look fantastic. They look really like the sort of concept background painting that you would see produced for a film. Mm-hmm. That does not translate into s- serialized se- no. sequential storytelling. You can't make lots of little panels that look like that. His anatomy is all over the place. There's no consistency to the design. He's randomly picking up on uh, and using like G1 style, like Evan uh, 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 Casey Collier or Guido Guidi style G1 influence designs, and just putting them in the same panel with uh, Don Figueroa's ugly movie-fied bots from the first story arc of the ongoing. There's no thought in it at all. Uh, the the painterly coloring, like while technically impressive, just obfuscates everything. Yeah, I mean, God help you if you can figure out who all those flying Autobots that are taking off in that one panel of the last issue of the oh, Ongoing yeah. are supposed to be. Two red A-10 Warthogs? I don't think so. No. Yeah. I, this, I uh, mean, that's a good... Brandon McCarthy. Uh, no, not Brandon McCarthy. <laughs> Brandon, what's his name? Brandon Cahill? Brandon Cahill is the artist on uh, Police Action, and he's great. This is awesome. He, 
great yeah, I, storytelling he's elements. He's the kind of artist that I have mentioned in the past that I would really like to see more of on Transformers, which is a good all-rounder. A guy who can actually draw humans well and can draw robots well. Not a super detailed mecha artist. Like, Don Figueroa draws awesome robots on a technical level. His humans look like dump. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Guido Guidi draws great robots and he draws great humans as well. Uh, they're little, they're little um, static, you know. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the influ- influence, I don't even know what Livio, the guy doing um, the ongoing, uh, the, doing chaos would make of a human. Uh, you look at the uh, Hearts of Darkness miniseries where the guy couldn't draw Transformers to save his life. You know, um, mech detailing ability, en- the ability to draw convincingly engineered robots that look like they would work in the real world is often put ahead of actual artistic skill when it comes to Transformers comics. And this guy here is an example of why that's never a good idea. Because, you know, while these robots are not going to blow your mind with all the cool gears and details and things that they may have buried in them, you know, what they do have is body language and personality. Which is effect- what matters, right? I mean, God. It effectively comes through constantly. Yeah, I and he's think, able to tell a story as well. Like sequentially, there's never a question of what's actually happening here. I, to go into maybe a bit more of the philosophical range, but that's that's why you have like that's why this stuff works on the page and doesn't work in the film, and vice versa. Because on film, it has to look realistic and be parts and things. Here, it doesn't have to be. It can be the impression, it can be the idea, and you can fill in the blanks for yourself. It just has to move and give emotion, and you know, be be in the story and that's what happens here it's uh, yay it tells a story with pictures not the lingering pollution of the mind that dreamwave wrought you know i've said it before but dreamwave were all about the flash and the zazzle and the style and trying to make like really big hulking tech greebleed um uh, you know, not necessarily that looked like real in the real world, but just were covered in pointless detail. And mm-hmm. Figueroa's obsessive compulsive need to redesign everything and make it look like it could actually physically transform if it were a toy, if it were a toy, not if it were in the real world as a robot. Mm-hmm. Um, it's um, it's just it was the sort of thing Dreamwave. It was really evident in like their crossovers with GI Joe, the World War Two one, or the the original GI Joe crossover, the Devil's Due did, uh, a lot of those ones actually, where they would put and the War Within, of course, is one of the biggest culprits of it. And why the War Within is so chronically overrated, in my opinion, um, is because like the big draw was look, look, we've designed Cybertronian modes for everyone. You know, Dreamwave taught Dreamwave uh, implicitly taught the lesson that redesigning a transformer so that it looks like it transforms into something else was one of the most important things above everything else and it's ta- you know it's taken a, lo- mm-hmm. a a generation of fan artists still haven't shaken off the worst lessons that dreamwave taught um, but finally, you know, uh, IDW we, we we you know IDW carried over the guys who were good from dreamwave and a couple of the guys who sucked, uh, <laughs> but who but who have um, uh, blossomed under IDW, and they've also been willing to to bring in you know people who actually know how to tell a friggin' story here as well, and uh, you know where where they're they're drawing a comic first and a Transformers comic second, mm-hmm. and that's the key to actually getting this thing to move beyond just some weird little fan thing that only fans will pick up you know yeah uh, so uh, by the way yeah the police story is pretty good <laughs> yeah uh, yeah other than that it's... i may have digressed into some kind of anti dream way of rant there <laughs> it's always worth it um but uh, no but no i mean this is good it's like my comic shop doesn't order enough of these so i have to keep this on my pull list in order to get it and i'm getting it for police action and then i have yep. to sit through freaking chaos Damn it. <laughs> well, there's only two more parts of Chaos. Okay, good. And I'm then getting... it's Roshan, Roberts, and Barber. So does that mean it's all going to get better then? I'm going to be okay? It could not be with that creative thing. Yeah. I think the thing that's hilarious, though, is that Chaos is the one that's credited to, to Costa and, Robert, uh, and Roberts. And uh, it, even, even with Roberts' influence, it's still just not as good as... I mean, well, Chaos has just sort of farted its way into the ongoing off the back of the dreadful Hearts of Darkness miniseries and really nothing else. Like, notionally, it kind of goes back to Furman's earliest stuff, 
but only in the sense that Galvatron and the Heart of Darkness are in it. Yeah. But you know, the, the plot doesn't follow on from that at all. This police action is actually two years worth of plots coming together. Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, some of these story elements, they go back to the suppressors. They're talking about stuff that happened to some of these human characters. That's the issue Spike. is Spike found her and himself out. Yeah. Um, you know, which goes it back all like the way to, like, All Hail Megatron yeah. and... <sighs> hey, it's a big connected universe, people. That's fun. I don't know. Chaos just sucks. Just, I mean, it doesn't feel like it. It's like it notionally follows on from Hearts of Darkness, but it doesn't feel like it does. Yeah. It's like it's turning into like Galvatron will just have dreamed the whole thing, and he's really just crazy old Galvatron. And, 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 and the, you know, halfway through the story, the Devoid hasn't even been mentioned. I mean, I mean, that's the thing, though. Half the reason that Chaos is only happening the way it's happening is because Galvatron just refuses to tell, to tell the Autobots what's wrong. I mean, if Which... he would just say... By the way, space monster. Yeah, which you would think, I mean, and that's that's one of those things that's like seems reasonable to do. And the Autobots are gullible, so they would totally help out because that's what they do. So it's it's like an artificial and, 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 point. Yeah, it's not like uh, Galvatron legitimately wants help too. You know. Yeah, it's he's, not like he's not wanting help. His pride won't let him. Uh, okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, you've blown up a chunk of the planet, have you? I mean, I'm, I'm, given that we're halfway through it, the Devoid hasn't even been mentioned or factored into it at all. The big moment in the next issue appears to be the creation of the Decepticod and Megatron fighting it in his sweet new armor. I'm like, does the Devoid exist? Did Galvatron honestly dream it all and he's been tricked into this or he's just crazy or something? I am like 75% actually expecting that to be the resolution at this point. It is so completely unrelated. But you should read this. You should read the police action. <laughs> read police action. That's good. Though it might mean little to you if you haven't read the rest of the ongoing, and it's certainly yeah. not going to you. You know, if you're if you're the kind of miserable so and so, only only robots all the time, no humans. Uh, you know, police action isn't going to do it for you. But you're dumb and wrong. So, yeah, I exactly. Know, so like this is good stuff. I don't know. I mean, it's like, and I've only been peripherally reading uh, ongoing and peripherally involved in some of the things. And there's things that are tying into things I know and things I've seen. So it's kind of like, oh, that's cool. I like it. So anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm at least every other week. I don't feel bad about having <laughs> having on having transformers on my pull list because it's like I get. I get the damned chaos thing, and I'm like, this sucks. I'm going to drop this. Because I think I even said that, like, what, last week or week before. It's like, I'm going to drop this Probably. crap. I hate it, you know. And then I get this. I'm like, damn, this is good stuff. I kind of like it. I'm going to stay on. Ah. So, <laughs> the infinite <laughs> contradiction. <laughs> uh, why couldn't they have just made chaos a side story? Make that a mm. mini. That would have been fun. Well, it obviously was supposed to be. Two more parts of Chaos, one more part of this, and then the 125th issue. And then, well, not even then, because the 125th issue is by Robert Roche and Barber. So, Man, this is going to, you know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, Transformers is about to get really exciting again, I think. I mean, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I legitimately hadn't been as like excited with a piece of Transformers fiction as I was for a long time until like last week's prime episode. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you asked me like a, a couple of months ago at the idea of Unicron appearing in Transformers prime. And I would have gone, uh, you know, because yeah. everybody was sick of Unicron after the Unicron trilogy. Um, but I came to realize that uh, enough time had passed since he'd last actually done anything. Because he'd really last done anything in Energon. So that's like six years ago, seven yeah. years ago, even nearly. Um, that I was okay with it. But even if I hadn't been, the new twist Prime put on him would have would have caught my attention and got me excited anyway. Yeah. Like, I contemplated the notion that they might have been going in that route with him, but I didn't think they would because it was so freaking insane. And they did it. Yep. And then you get a flashback with the 13 stomping around. I couldn't shut my jaw. It was yeah. hanging open. The 13 I... fabled progenitors of Cybertron that are so important, their entire existence has previously been confined to Q&A panels at BotCon. 
Yeah, finally in some sort of on a you know, freaking con- just not not even. I mean, like, yeah, okay, we got a little bit crept out in a novel last year. Like, but nobody except us read like the the nerdy the hardcore nerd contingent, and then suddenly kaboom, wallop, right there on the primary Transformers cartoon airing right now. And I'm like, holy shit! Well, you can't. What is this? Where am I living? Yeah. Is this the bizarro world? And then to think that like two of the best Transformers comics writers out of the last decade are going to be the guys who are now in control of the forward motion of the IDW comics? Fuck, dude. Yeah. This is good times. This is good. St- I mean, yeah, you know, and uh, the yeah, I mean, it, I mean, Prime, the and especially like when you're talking about like this version of Unicron, it's a it's a different version of Unicron in fact, but it's, I mean, if anything, we've got the Unicron that we've gotten over the last several years. When you talk about like Unicron from the Unicron trilogy, uh, uh big uh, dumb planet, you know, not uh, more of fair, a f- Armada. Armada had a good twist on Unicron for as little as he yeah. appeared in it. Like their handling of Unicron was, it was still a big planet raging, but he actually had a personality and motivations and he manipulated characters in a, you know, he was good in Armada. He was right. good. But beyond that, I mean, about, for the most part, it's just been force of nature and not really, you know. Actually, he transitioned even more into force of nature after that because you had the Armada comics, which mm-hmm. were like the ones to introduce the idea of Unicron wandering across the dimensions like a force destroying all reality, not just a big munchy planet. He was in the Dreamwave Generation 1 comics. Mm-hmm. He was the Armada cartoon, he was in the Armada comics. Like, War Within was the only thing that was happening at the time, the only piece of fiction that was happening that wasn't Unicron driven. Mm-hmm. And then, like, two issues before the end of War Within the Dark Ages, it turned out the fall and worked for Unicron. And it was like, ah, for fuck's sake. <laughs> 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 yeah, but this is, this is a different. I mean, he's like capable for so long and i don't think it's any coincidence that as a consequence of that like idw the movies and animated all completely eschewed that yeah just well and then like i said it's been enough time like you said it's been enough time it's been you know, this used is... the whole to to formulate this whole idea around unicron and primus in the 13 yeah so it's good yeah it's good i, I think it's a good time to be around you know the side fiction we're kind of out of the movie thing now i think and even rewatching, I rewatched some of the movie, the, the third movie the other day, Dark of the Moon. It's like, this is not bad. Well, it's not out on DVD here yet, but Revenge of the Full One was on television here on the UK mm-hmm. uh, just, just uh, this afternoon. And I'm the sort of person that would sit down and, and, and put that on. And I, I wouldn't apologize for that. Um, no. But except I sort of do. <laughs> <laughs> except you kind of are. But I don't know. <laughs> I even like Devastator in that. I mean, the, at least the movie universe version of him. You know, it's like that makes sense within that universe anyway. But anyway, anyway we digress. Free Cybertron. Yes. Yeah. We digress. So, um, I guess does that bring us then to? Uh, do you have I anything else? So. No, no, that's about it. I, I, but I read Rocket <laughs> Raccoon in the last week as well, and that's just tremendous. Ooh. <laughs> the original Rocket Raccoon miniseries. So, um, in my continuing. Uh, eating crow. I'm reading a Superman comic and Hell liking yeah. it a lot. Damn it! Um, if if I hadn't been on board for Action Comics after issue one, though I was, uh, issue number two would have done the job. Oh my god! It's not only is uh, it good. It's like kitchen sink good though, because there's like oh and I that's know. oh and then there's oh and that's the oh this is the sort of this is the you know I, I said it about Firestorm last week and I don't really want to keep using the term but really this does move this up from just being slightly different story about the early years of Superman in Metropolis to a full on ultimate Superman sort of story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He hasn't just lived out his life on Smallville as he always did and then decided to come to Metropolis and mess up authority for a while before becoming Superman. Like, this is wholly different. Ma and Pa can't or dead. He doesn't know where he comes from or what he is. Um, the, the legacy references that this drops alone are worth the price of admission, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean... And there's nothing really weird or overly Morrison-like confusing like the last issue with the little troll man and his bomby train and everything. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, and just, and the characterization, I mean, Luther, oh. 
Oh, loving, loving Luther. Luther. First panel with Luther, it's just like it. It. It's not He's human. Back every day. <laughs> every time someone says he or they, he just corrects them. It. He just keeps it. wanting to refer to Superman as it. Oh. Love that. But I love it in this. It's like you know, you you know, you're definitely looking at an underpowered Superman in this as well. When it, when a, 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 a an electric chair is able to keep him down, you know, at least for a while. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and they can't get needles in him, and they can't X-ray him or anything, you know. But he's off balance enough from the electricity that he, he can't quite get himself recovered. Yeah, and and so it gives it a nice. I mean, it gives it some progression in that way. I mean, again, where we're we're seeing him really early and not fully fully powered mm. up and he's still an angry fellow as well i mean just give a quick rundown of the issue that's what happened after after last issue where he was pinned by a speeding locomotive uh lex luthor and general leon have superman captive uh and they're experimenting on him and his cape which is revealed to be indestructible like real real classic golden yes age. i love that that element is back yeah um lewis manages to sneak onto the base um and uh doesn't really accomplish anything actually no. while she's there she, she accomplishes meeting him you know um but uh, superman basically gets luthor to talk and uh, just long enough to be able to recover his strength to break out he uh, he gets his cape back and very very interestingly he finds what is presumably his rocket yeah it looks that way because i mean there's a really interesting thing like like uh, uh, luthor doesn't believe that he's actually human form he thinks he's he's changed shape and he wheels out this little five, six-legged goat thing. Yeah. I mean, I really thought he was going to wheel crypto out there. Oh, I almost did for a second. I was like, yeah. no. <laughs> but, like, this is some, I mean, they, and they mention an, uh, another rocket as well. So, I mean, I, I, presumably this is his rocket, but I guess notionally it could have been the rocket that brought this thing. But, I mean, uh, the rocket recognizes kal and just speaks Kryptonian to him. How wonderful scene as well. Like, you, you can really imagine this for quite cinematic as the alien voice booms out. Imagine Terrence Stamp, if you will, you know, <laughs> speaking in Kryptonian. Hala Kal-El, Don Jor-El, Lavaral, Orvan Vaxel, El Kor, El Krypton, El Rao, El Eo. Kal-El! Boom! Whoosh! Crash! <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's just... No, I, I I, mean, I think the implication would be it's his rocket. I would imagine the other rocket is uh, Kara. Whatever. Well, I no, because that's only literally just happened in the first issue of Supergirl. Are they doing something else? So. Yeah, well, Supergirl. they said the other rocket's coming. I mean, they didn't say how long until... No, wait, which rocket are we talking about here? You're know. talking about the thing Luthor dropped the reference to out in space? Yeah. Last oh, well, no, I think that's... No, they talk about another... Well, hang on, where's the specific... Hang on. Find it now. Now that we're talking about it. Uh, I can't find it now. Dissecting the creature. Torture is a bad thing. <laughs> um, oh, here we go. Uh, we tried everything. No, hang on wait a minute. That, we, it's like the rocket all over again. Uh, the train crash. Uh, you should probably edit this out. Uh, yeah, we don't edit that. We know what the rocket is. It's a bullet. Uh, I was sure there was a reference um, to another rocket. Uh, maybe I was wrong then. Hmm. I don't know. I thought there was a reference to to another rocket, but no, I guess maybe there was, well, that's probably, well, the question of where this other thing has come from then remains as well. Yeah. Unless it was in, yeah, I don't know. Hmm. But yeah, it does I mean, kind of Maybe that... I'm just completely wrong then. Edit that bit out. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> don't do that. Now you should edit it. I, just I don't. To me, I in a sense edit. of forward motion. I can't edit it. <laughs> sure you You're can. You're wasting it's more time. Just Anyway, well, so... Yeah. And then, and then uh, Superman escapes. Uh, he bumps into Lewis, and off he shoots. And um, that's about. The, then we get some uh, potential teases for uh, Superman bodies of legend. No, it, it was, uh, several. I mean, there's like, and then that's well, that's the whole like. So there's that story, which the story in itself is great. I mean, because here yeah. again, Superman being smart, sort of playing into Luther's weakness of wanting to drone on. In order to escape, um, Lois is. You know, there's this, and when he escapes, it's such a wonderful minute as well. Because I watch a fair bit of anime, okay? Mm -hmm. And anime, 
tends to be full of really pompous villains. The hero will train because it's anime, so you gotta have a training sequence in there somewhere, you know. And they will train and train, and they will develop superpowers, and they will beat the villain in the first thirteen or twenty-six episodes. But then an even more powerful villain will arrive, mm-hmm. and that villain will shrug off every attack with a knowing smirk. And so the hero must train again. <laughs> <laughs> they are powerful enough to defeat the new, much more powerful villain. You're but not watching Dragon I... Ball Z, are you? <laughs> no, no. no. Um, but uh, I really hate those kinds of villains, those really smarmy kinds of smirky villains who think they're the best thing since toast. And uh, and then I always love that moment they get whenever the hero is able to get a little scratch on their face. So they're able to do something the guy wasn't expecting. And usually in anime, it involves a close-up on their eyeball or their, or their teeth, and their eye will flex open a little wider, or their teeth will grit, and they'll usually make one of those Japanese voice actor type noises. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And I live for those little moments. And holy Christ, does Lex Luthor get one of those little oh, moments? Oh, yes. It's like, you know, you're not that smart. You know, you have a giant brain, but how will you handle being punched? Yeah. <laughs> no, wait, wait a minute. What is this? Do something! <laughs> yeah. Your brain isn't going to, you know, going to uh, stop that too much. Uh, yeah, that is a that is a great sequence. Uh, of, but you could definitely understand where the enmity will come from then as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't really notice it until I was reading. The, I mean, and now probably something we should mention is that this is a 20-page story uh, versus the slightly longer format that it was uh, because it's a $4 book. Uh, but it does try to give you the added value with uh, like a, a sort of eight-page director's commentary on the first issue talking about all the little elements, which I quite like, but I would still rather have eight more pages of story. Yeah, I would have liked more story. You know, it's, I mean, it, it's not really noticeable. They've done well by it, but Brent, uh, Brent Anderson has come in and penciled some pages of this. Rags Morales. Rags Morales couldn't even do 20 pages in a month. Wow, yeah. You know, if it was go. twenty, it was a twenty-eight page comic. I kind of understand, but he couldn't even do twenty pages in a month. Uh, and thankfully, now it's an artist that it's not immediately noticeable where the other work is, so it doesn't jump out at you. So it, it's a, a coherent and cohesive read. So uh, I still grumble at the, you know, you know, I don't, I don't think we should have to rely on filler artists to give us the things that are supposed to come out monthly on a regular schedule actually come out, you know, and I applaud DC's desire to make everything come out on time because Christ knows it's an ethic that a lot of creators could really stand to, to live by. Yeah. Maybe uh, if they tweeted less, um, they yeah. would. <laughs> hey, Dan Slott puts the comics out. Dan this Slott is true. Spidey's out every month. Big prop to Dan Slott for that, by the way. And he was talking yesterday about, uh, I guess there was some negative feedback that he had gotten from somewhere that said, oh, too much stuff happened in, in this issue. And it's like, really? That's a complaint? Yep. That's like, a bad thing. That's a good thing. I mean, crazy. But anyway, where are you, Dan? <laughs> But um, as I was saying, I hadn't really noticed until I read it in the director's commentary how it's like, Superman is always in motion. When he's out, when he's doing things, when he's on the go, he is always moving. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's always in mid-run or mid-whirl. Or, or he's, it's only when he stops moving that he's Clark Kent or that shit's about to go down. Yeah. Yeah, that's Before true. Little t- I really noticed. And you do get that sense of motion out of nearly everything that he does, you know? Mm-hmm. Because, if... you know, still really good art in this. I can't tell where the joins are, if you no. know what I mean. No. No, this is, I mean, no, it's it's very good. Um, I appreciate also, um, maybe more of a side, but there's a lot of, like, sub-characters that are introduced mm. Well, you this. notice how we learn about these sub-characters and their relationships and their personalities through actual interaction of characters. Hey. What a concept. Crazy. We don't have to have narrative captions spell it out or first person narration say, I'm a loner. What I do best is, you know, this is yeah. just actual character interaction revealing their personalities to us. Yeah. And I mean, the characters that we meet, I mean, that's just where the, 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 uh, the, the meet and the, the, Icing on top comes in mm-hmm. when we find out that two of the guys here who are, are, are under General Lane uh, are John Corbin and John Henry Irons. Yeah, which is like, 
Wow! <laughs> And uh, they're both working. Uh, we heard it mentioned. Lex Luthor mentioned it last um, last issue. We see more of it this way. Is the Steel Soldier program, which is some kind of cybernetic battle suit. Mm -hmm. So the idea of putting John Corbin—that's Metallo. Yeah. For anybody for that those that don't know. And John, <laughs> yeah. And John Henry Irons, Steel. Yeah. Working together on a program to create like a cyborg battle suit. That is smart. That is ultimate level stuff. Something pulled right out of the 50s or whenever Metallo was created, right out of the 90s, colliding together in the middle. With all, it's so ultimate and so interesting. Well, it's and so smart. Yeah, because not only does it give you like a plausible a reason or ability for Metallo to be created in this universe, but it also gives you a plausible explanation for the construction of uh, steel. I mean, mm -hmm. it. it it makes that make sense because I mean, that was the, always the thing that didn't even make sense for Steel's original origin, which is a little strange nonetheless. I mean, as far as Steel's origin go, he was a weapons designer that, you know, in the story he had met up with Superman. And then, um, when Superman died, he like right after that, some of his weapons, his high damage weapons, like made it onto the street with the gangs so he decided in order to fight that, he would make he would become Iron Man, basically. Mm. And it's like that jump, that jump in technology just never like it didn't really click to me. Like how do you go from <coughs> general military hardware to building a full on, you know, exo suit? But this mm. makes sense because now yeah. he has experience with you know, working with battle suits and that kind of and technology. It's not just battle suits as well. Like we got here, we got the Professor Vale, who was the guy who created Metallo originally, working on the project. And he talks about a metal fusion technique six months away from being safe. Yeah, you know. So, so there's to this is not yeah. just going to be him stomping around in a suit. You know, this is the this is the. I, again, I can only call it ultimate style. It's yeah. total pulling things from all different eras, smushing them together in a way that really works and makes tremendous sense. I mean, this issue sees Irons quit because he won't be a party to Luthor torturing Superman. So, you know, he's already got sympathy for Superman involved. He's now his own agent with all of this incredible technology going on in his head. I mean, I don't imagine we'll see Steel a, a at all in this. No. A, a while, I could say, potentially years, if at all. It might just be a little reference Martin's put in there for us to get. It may not have any plans to fly it at all, but it's still the sort of thing that, uh, you know, there's something in here for it. Like it works as a completely functional and serviceable origin for a new reader to be introduced to Metallo, who is sure to come down the pipe quite shortly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, as one of his earliest films, which is funny because uh, it, in Jeff Johns and Gary Frank's Superman Secret Origin from last year, Metallo was one of the earliest villains that they did in it as well. I just hope that they take him out of that ridiculous green jumpsuit with a skull face <laughs> that, that he's that golden age look that they've been insistent on giving him over the last couple of years. Yeah, but I think it's a smart move too have... because a lot of people I think knew Metallo from like the Superman mm. animated series and things. So as far as like inter reintroducing or bringing in a villain to it I, for a Superman comic, I think that's a that's a smart move, you know. Superman has such a rubbish rogues gallery. He really anyway. does. He's but blown through what, three quarters of it in his one issue. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it, well, and also too, I guess for small, where Metallo is in Smallville as well. I guess that makes <laughs> sense as well with that. So, hey, editorial but smartness. We get, this, uh, we get this last page as well. <gasps> I know that it's here, you know, Lex Luthor's on the phone with somebody, uh, but he doesn't know who he's talking to. He's just talking to somebody, so somebody who's an anonymous tipster. You know, uh, Luthor says the word Krypton to Superman, asks him what it means whenever he has him locked up. And uh, it's just supposed to be a test. But Superman doesn't know what Krypton is. He just knows it's the gas. He doesn't know his history. He doesn't know what he is or where he's from. And Lex Luthor doesn't know what it means either. It was just a word fed to him by this anonymous voice on a phone who is, well, surely, uh, the, the final panel of the issue, we may as well say, we're here yeah. now, you know, it's a giant, like, floating city in space with all these mechanical tentacles swirling off it. Surely Brainiac. It's gotta be. I mean, I don't, I mean, yeah, the, yeah I mean, it's like, I, lo I mean, it's not, it's not the typical skull ship thing oh, that you're used to seeing, but it's like, I didn't, I wouldn't think that's anything but, Brainiac. I mean, that's so. That's the Luthor Brainiac team: Metallo, Steel, 
<laughs> Dan Lane, Lewis Lane, Jimmy Olsen, Terry White, Clark Kent, plus a whole uh, uh, rake of, of, of the supporting cast that is introduced in the first film. You know, two issues in. Talk about action comics. Like, Yeah. I, yeah. I think the, I think, I mean, the only question really left is how long until Luther steals cakes. I mean, really. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's terrible. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I would, uh, I would solidly assume as well that this is whatever it was that was up beyond Neptune that Luthor talked about in the first issue. Yeah, it's possible he that yeah. where this voice is coming from. So I'm assuming that this is whatever it is that has entered the solar system and is approaching that they nodded towards at the end of last issue. Yeah, that's more likely, I guess, than, yeah. So. And I still think that weird little tiny guy from the first issue is going to come back. Probably. This is good! Damn it! Oh, Why am I liking life? Superman? I know. What is wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. You like quality. Yeah, well, that's true. No one had sex in this either, so it's, that's nice. No, there's not really, isn't there? I mean, you yeah. could hand this to a kid. Yeah. I mean, the kid probably wouldn't get half of it more yeah. than half. But, like, it's not... There's nothing objectionable in there. I mean, uh, it's just... I mean, but this is it. Morrison does... You know, Morrison is a... He's not a man for dumbing things down or, or, or uh, he's not opposed to sexing things up or whatever. But he does have a, a wonderfully innocent and pure vision of Superman. You just have to mm-hmm. read All-Star Superman to see that. You know, oh, yeah. Superman is of truly one of the best of humanity or superhumanity, pure and brings out the goodness in those around him and everything, you know. So this is a slightly surprising take for Superman. It's like, that's the thing is with this. If anybody else, if somebody you'd never heard of had written this, you'd be like, oh my god, what have you done to Superman? How could you possibly come up with this? Don't you know what you're doing? But there's no way you can accuse Grant Morrison of not getting Superman yeah. when he does this. You know, this is all very... And I've said it before, like, if he's on this for a prolonged period of time, which I expect him to be, I imagine we will see Superman grow up through the different eras, that, the, the different ways that the character was defined in the different eras of, of his history. You know, starting out with the way he was in the first couple of issues of Action Comics, kicking indoors and fighting, taking down the man. And the... Yeah, I mean, well, and did, did I... Was this picture in the last one where he's in the very like action comics number one cover pose uh, with the no, car. It was, no, that's always fun when you see that. But that's <laughs> always nice. I mean, that's just a and a headline return of the Superman, which is sort of da 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 da. Yeah, leaping yeah, tall buildings. Is, I mean, this is absolutely stuff. the best thing I'm reading out of the new. I think, and I, I think that's maybe you know even to say like I talked about Superman last week, where it was just like. I think the reason I like both of these is because it's at least not like a very heavy handed sort of trying to reinvent Superman. It's like this isn't really trying to reinvent Superman so much as it's just trying to invent Superman. You know, it's like, you know, it's these are the elements that, you know, these are characters that, you know, these are things that, you know, and they're put together in the way that you would expect them to be. And they're good. So it's not like what a Superman, concept. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> do the thing that it is and do that right. I mean, you know, again, not to, I mean, we're sort of, you know, to talk about what like Dan Slott's doing with Spider-Man. I mean, there you go again. I mean, it was like Spider-Man being who he is and doing it well. Hey, crazy idea. Well, like on so, a load of different characters and threads and ideas from yeah. all throughout Spider-Man history and whirling them together in ways that are surprising and yet make tremendous amounts of sense. And what a shock. Hey, it's, it's a good. good comic. Yeah. Wow. You know, yeah, I mean, here we don't we don't have Superman fighting bizarre things in the middle of space, nowhere, with nothing cares about. We don't have um, Superman walking across the country or anything like that. It's just good don't story. Have Superman was laying having sex on a rooftop. Yeah, well, that <laughs> as well. So, damn it, I hate I I love super I'm loving this. I, this is You're good. Re- you are really conflicted. <sighs> I it really it. <laughs> It's messing with my head. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I, I'm, I I'm, love it. I'm giving money to Superman comics. I don't know what is wrong with me. but And Transformers as well. Do you realize? Do you realize that I gave money to a Superman comic and a Transformers comic this week? 
It was about all you gave money to. I know, really. All I had was in that in JLI booster, which I will always <laughs> drop money on regardless. So, anyway. Sort of a more Protestant sort of a mind of comics next week. Yeah. Uh, I but... had like nine or ten on a fucking graphic novel. Yeah. But this is good stuff. I mean, really, it's like if you didn't have this on your pull, you should. I mean, you really, you know, get the reprints I mean, you know, or whatever. Maybe I mean, you're not in. Maybe you're not into the idea of what's happening here, but I, I guess there's not really any helping you if you're How not. Can you not be. I mean, because, like I said, nobody oops. hates Superman more than me, and I can't say that this is bad. I mean, it's and just... if, even if you love Superman, the guy that's writing this probably actually loves Superman more than you do. Grant yeah. Morrison loves Superman. Yeah. Probably more than you, whoever you are out there, dear listener. So, and he's, you know, it's like, nah, it's just really freaking good. And it is easily the best thing I've read out of the new 52. I think this oh. and Batwoman have been my two favorites. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like there was something else I really liked, but I'm so, I don't know. I'm so caught up on this right now, I just can't. Yeah, your brain is filled with goodness. And they try so hard to kill Superman, and it doesn't work. That's the other thing that's so funny. <laughs> they just keep trying gas and things. I loved that, though. I anyway. know, yeah. It's <laughs> such a Indian methodology, such real like things that you would probably sadly expect governments to do. Gas it, cut it, poke it. Right. Oh, we're done. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway. Okay. And the last thing they actually try to do, it's so Lex Luthor is like, he gasses him, he tries to cut him, he takes samples, he pokes him, he x-rays him. The last thing, the last resort for Lex Luthor is to actually talk to him. Yeah, that was like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But again, it goes back to that it, you know, calling him it, which is just awesome. Anyway, okay, this is Superman good stuff. laughs at him and Lex Luthor just goes, stop doing that. <laughs> oh, man, this is good. This is a thing, it's like the, it's, uh, it's the end of, it's almost like, you know, it's like the traditionally, or, well, more in the modern time, it's like, because Superman, uh, is more than a man, it, like, it demeans, it, Lex Luthor, like, takes it as an insult to his humanity, like, it demeans who he is. And it feels yeah, like the, it's like, he almost sees him as, like, an abomination of humanity. I mean, like, that's the traditional view of yeah. but this is almost like, He's angry because he can't figure him out. It's not an insult to his humanity. It's almost like a backhander to his intelligence because Superman represents something, not that he cannot be, but something that he does not know. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I can see that. But yeah. Hmm. Of course, then he gets dragged and bit around by him. So it's probably become a lot more personal and physical after this issue. Yeah. You know, you can really see how this issue transitions Superman from like uh, uh, an intellectual puzzle that Luthor feels he has to solve into a problem that he feels he needs to eliminate. Eliminate. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Uh, When's this next issue? Next month? Damn it. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know. So awesome. Well, kids, we managed to make it an hour and a half. Functional. Yeah. Two of us can do this show, though we don't recommend it. We don't need those other guys. <laughs> uh, ugh. Wait, no, what? No, I didn't say anything. I mean, I mean uh, uh, they're no. valued members of the team. Valued, <laughs> very valued. No, we definitely miss having uh, Nicole and Triplet this week, so... Very much looking forward to having uh, them back next week so that us two fanboys don't just uh, drone on about stuff. I like reckon that. is how they'd probably be joining in with this one. Triple, I, I, was, I, I'm, I'm, I know Triplet's not here because I, I was hoping to hear what he thought about this issue. Yeah, definitely. And then Brian had some thoughts. Brian's talking about maybe doing something on the side, not the show, but at least a blog, which we may be able to reference, which would be fun. Hope he does that. So, Anyway... That's going to be it. We're going to get out of here. That's the show. Um, should be a bigger show next week and with other people, so that should be fun. Uh, again, tune in live 4 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. GMT time, live at tfradio.net slash live. Uh, we like to have people in the chat. We referenced Cassius was here today, uh, so we thank him for showing up as well. Also, go to the website, tfradio.net, uh, also fanboyversus.com, Twitter, all that good stuff. So, anyway, again, um, that's it. That's the show for this week. Thanks so much 
uh, for tuning in. We'll see you next week, and please tune in next time when it will be Fanboy versus. This has been Fanboy versus. Visit us at tfradio.net for show notes and to subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on Twitter at TF Radio for news and updates. Like the podcast? Leave us feedback on iTunes. Copyright 2011, Radio Free Cybertron.